Room. Well, this is an idea the Speaker has taken the decision in the interest of public safety and procedures will continue to be reviewed on a daily basis. Um, I want to refer um, members to the memo from the Speaker, which is in the table pack. Uh, the closure of Parliament buildings to the public obviously means that there will be no members of the public in the public uh, gallery during meetings. Obviously, witnesses in attendance may still be in the public gallery, obviously. However, given the requirement for proceedings of the Assembly to be held in public, as he stands that all meetings are not held uh, in closed session are broadcast. And the uh, advice on social distancing is that the, the, the British, uh, has been issued by the, the British Government. And what it says is that avoid contact with someone who is displaying symptoms of COVID-19. These include high temperature uh, or new or continuous uh, cough. Avoid non-essential use of public transport, varying times of your travel, times to rush, avoid rush hour when possible. Work from home where possible. Your employer should support you to do this. Avoid large gatherings uh, and gatherings in similar public spaces such as pubs, cinemas, restaurants, theatres, bars, clubs, etc. Avoid gatherings with family and friends. Keep in touch using remote technology such as phone, internet and social media. Use telephone or online service to contact your GP or other essential services. And while it's important that everyone follow these measures, there was strong advice to significantly limit face-to-face -face interaction if possible, particularly if you are over 70, have an underlying health condition uh, or are pregnant. For the group of people with an underlying health condition, the advice is that they should be particularly stringent in, fo in following social distancing measures. This group, uh, specific group, is defined as those who are under the age of 70 with an underlying health condition listed below. Um, anyone who instructed to get a flu job as an adult each year on medical grounds. So chronic long-term respiratory diseases such as asthma, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, COPD, um, emphysema or bronchitis, chronic heart disease such as heart failure, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease such as hepatitis, chronic neurological conditions such as Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, multiple cirrhosis, a learned disability or cerebral palsy, diabetes, problems with your spleen, for example, sickle cell disease, or if you have had your spleen removed, a weakened immune system as a result of conditions such as HIV, AIDS, or medicines such as steroid tablets or chemotherapy are being seriously overweight with a body mass index of 40 or above. In addition, there are some clinical conditions uh, which have put people at even higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19. These include people who have complex health problems, such as those who have uh, received an organ transplant or remain in ongoing uh, immunosuppression uh, medication, people who have cancer or underlying um, undergoing active chemotherapy or radiotherapy, uh, people with cancers of the blood or bone marrow, such as leukemia, uh, who are at any stage of treatment, people with severe chest conditions, such as cystic fibrosis or severe asthma, which requires hospital admission or courses of steroid tablets, or people with severe diseases of body systems, uh, such as severe kidney disease. Uh, can I advise members that in terms of committee meetings, um, you can spread out as we have done uh, around the table, uh, like we have done today, and you may stand or sit elsewhere, such as in the public gallery. Unfortunately, the microphones cannot pick up from anywhere other than the committee table. So if you want to ask a question, you will need to be at the table if you are... Um, not at the table currently. Uh, can I advise that due to social distancing measures that they're, they're recommended our four witnesses um, will not all sit at the table together. Uh, two of the witnesses will sit and speak at the table and the other two witnesses uh, will sit behind them. When required, they will come forward and speak as the microphones will not pick up uh, from behind the main speakers. Members need to bear this in mind when it comes to questions and be mindful that officials will come and go at the table depending on who will be answering the question. It's up to the committee themselves to decide how frequently they meet and how much business they carry out. Uh, members may wish to con reconsider our forward work programme in order to allow A, uh, to allow us to focus on COVID-19 measures, B, reduce the time we spend on other non-essential business, and we can discuss this aspect a little further detail on the forward uh, work programme uh, agenda item. It may be that some witnesses are unwilling or restricted by their own workplace policies from attending the committee meetings. Some witnesses may be unwell and looking after vulnerable people and feel unable to attend. There has been some testing of the capacity of the Assembly to facilitate video conferencing at committee meetings, but I understand that there are some uh, problems with this and it may not be easy to, to get a quick solution. Um, 
Right, okay. Can we take some time now to consider this mat matter? Uh, this is a fast-moving and rapidly changing situation, and the advice we receive for the meeting next week may be radically different. Um, okay. Okay, sorry, okay. So we'll just uh, basically open up for discussion, including um, only only essential business and council outside events, meetings and visits. Um, Philip, you have anything you want to speak? Yeah, uh, I mean, I appreciate uh, the update, Chair, and it's very, very useful uh, for, for the, the work of this committee. And I also note the uh, advice uh, from the, the Speaker of the House and other things that are happening with regard to essential business only in the Chamber from, from this point forward. Obviously, COVID-19 is at the forefront of everything that, that we are doing and should be doing, and that's right and proper. And, you know, I, I'm just uh, a bit maybe concerned, given the current uh, crisis that we're facing, that there are three uh, bills, agriculture, environment and fisheries, that we're discussing in detail today, and there are three bills that are, are, are going through Westminster. And I'm just wondering if it is the committee's view, or should it be the committee's view, that whilst they are important, they're, they're, they can appeal on this insignificance with the crisis that we and our community are facing. And I note that we have uh, officials who are t here today to give a briefing, and I note from the advice of the speaker that we're trying to cut down on non-essential work from officials so that both within this department and all other departments that uh, civil servants and ministers can focus on the real important thing uh, before us, which is obviously COVID-19. I noticed over the last couple of days there have been a number of uh, statements from within the industry and from the minister himself about the potential impact of COVID-19 within our agri-food uh, industry. And I think that that is the, the important issue that we as a committee and our officials and our minister should be dealing with. And, you know, if possible, I know these bills are going through Westminster. I mean, uh, what I'd like to ask for is maybe the support of this committee that as a committee we write to the department and, and others to suggest that some pause be put on these bills uh, over the, the forthcoming period to allow us and our officials and our department to focus on the important aspect, which is protecting our industry and protecting human life over the next period of time. And I'm not saying these aren't important, but I think if there was some kind of delay till we get through this immediate crisis, that would be very, very helpful. And I would propose as such. And I'll bring Rosemary first. It, it is on the same issue, yes. Uh -huh. When I hear what you're saying, Philip, what are the consequences of us uh, not continuing with those bills? That's that's what I that's what I'm asking. I want to know the consequences in relation to if we don't continue. I know they're continuing in Westminster with them, but what's the consequences of not doing so here? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Norman and Brian, thank you very much for coming forward. And Norman, maybe you want to pick up on those two uh, yeah. proposals and questions. Well, cer certainly from the perspective of the Agriculture Bill, this is absolutely vital uh, for the provision of farm support uh, for next year and beyond. If you don't have the bill uh, completed, um, then we won't have the ability to make any support uh, to farmers uh, next year. And therefore, it, it's crucial that we do have that piece of legislation uh, completed. Uh, in good time uh, to enable that to, to happen. Uh, so yes, we're in we're in a a crisis uh, at, the, at this point in time around uh, COVID, uh, but we don't want to be in another one next year uh, with, with the absence of uh, support for farmers uh, on the fisheries and environment. Um, <coughs> Tracy, if you want to say a few words. Maybe by, just by way of an update from the environmental policy colleagues, it's just to say that executive clearance has now been received to seek legislative consent from the Environment Bill. Um, it's hoped to actually lay the memorandum today with the expectation that the committee will clear its report around the 23rd of April. Um, and then the motion would then be tabled at the earliest opportunity, which again, uh, policy colleagues are advising that that's the 4th of May. So officials from EPD are willing to give for, you know, further briefing on this. 
throughout the whole process or to assist in any way. But it's just to say that it is business as usual in terms of trying to progress these through the system. And the fisheries? Uh, fisheries bill? Um, I don't think we have anybody here on the fisheries. Uh, I'll take an action to update yeah. you on the fisheries. Thanks. William? Uh, yeah, yeah there will be a lot of concerns. Um, but I think in government we are here to try and I think we should be trying to do our best to continue as usual. To, to, you know, I, I think <clears throat> there is some panic out there, there is, and I can fully understand the situation, but I think we as legislators and as members of the Assembly should be making every effort to continue to do our business. Uh, that would be my view. Pat? Um, I think all efforts have been made here. I want to thank just Stella and the rest of the team for us as best as we possibly can in the circumstances that we're in. And I do believe that our community is looking to us and I would have to hope that we could probably progress as much as possible, taking on board everything that Phillips has said. And if there is an emergency or something that, that comes out, I'm sure that we would hope to be able to take to it. But I would be in favour of trying to conduct this in light of what just what we've been told there. And so, just to underline that again, Norman, the, the, the consequences of the legislation being parked either here or in Westminster, what, what exactly? Well, if, if we don't uh, give the legislative consent, uh, then if, if, uh, and we assume that the bill then would progress uh, in Parliament without uh, the Northern Ireland clauses, uh, and therefore we, that gives us with no legislative basis for farm support for next year. Uh, our only option then would be to bring, try to bring forward some emergency uh, primary legislation uh, through uh, the Assembly here. And obviously within the timelines, the timescales available to us, that would be uh, very, very challenging to try and do that. Um, so um, I certainly would be very keen uh, for the, uh, the legislative consent uh, to proceed uh, and to provide that. It is reassurance to the, to the agriculture sector uh, that there, there is a, a basis of uh, support from next year. Um, Claire? Thank you, Chair. Um, and I fully hear what you're saying, Philip, um, and ideally would love to be able to do that as well, but maybe asking of the department, do you feel that you're well enough resourced to be able to deal with both COVID-19 and get these bills through? Um, well, obviously, it's 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 uh, it's, it's going to be a, a challenge uh, more broadly for the department. Uh, but in terms of uh, the agriculture bill in particular, uh, I mean we, we've done much of the heavy lifting uh, in terms of uh, getting it to this point. Um, and yes, there will be some uh, subordinate legislation that will be required uh, probably in the autumn uh, to make sure that we have uh, all of the elements uh, in place for next year. But we can't even get to that point if we don't have the primary legislation in place, um, which is why it's so important that we do, we do that at this stage. Uh, you find that the other two bills, the environment and the fisheries, will be at the same stage in terms of the heavy lifting having been done? Um, on, the well, on the environment bill, there's still a fair bit to go, obviously, um, in terms of even engaging and consulting. Yeah. Um, so there's still a lot of steps in the process. Um, and just we're well aware, and we're probably going to come on to that, we'll come on to our COVID-19 contingency plans, that not only will we um, have an impact in terms of loss of staff, but there will be also loss of staff and, and organisations who we want to consult. Okay. We're moving picture. But we are business as usual. We are, in all intents and purposes, we're moving forward as best we can, business as usual. Oh yeah, sorry, just to be clear, I mean, I, I wasn't suggesting that MLAs don't carry on with their business. What I was talking about was actually prioritising business uh, for ourselves and the department. I also wasn't suggesting that we don't do our work if Westminster is carrying through with the bill. My suggestion was that we make some representation to Westminster that they park these bills to allow everybody to focus on the, I mean I wasn't even thinking of the point that you've just raised that there will be groups out there who we need to take advice from who will be laying staff off I mean we're, we're kind of going into unchartered waters 
at, at the minute, and I just know that that this is important. Uh, I mean, we don't want to leave a situation where the agriculture industry isn't getting the money, but we were able to do it this year without this bill. Uh, and as I say, what, what I was suggesting wasn't that we stop our process while others carry on and, and leave our farmers and agriculture sector exposed. I was suggesting that as a committee and as a department that with one voice we're kind of getting that message across to Westminster that maybe in the light of what's happening that everybody parks this until we overcome the immediate crisis at our, at our door. Hi. Okay, yeah. thank you, Chair. I mean, I appreciate all the comments, but I would feel at the minute we are really only doing what's necessary and we do need to continue doing it while we, we can. I mean, I think at the minute we still can, so let's <coughs> keep doing as you say. It's the future we're talking about here, you know, complicating that. So, yep, I would say we keep going <coughs> while we still can. Thank you. Chairman, I think. General public are looking to us to do to continue and, and deliver for them and do what we can. And I, I think if there's issues that arise over and above what we're doing, you know, for ordinary meetings, if there's something that is pressing, I have no issue having an extra meeting or an extra sitting if we have to. But I think we need to do our business to the best of our ability. I, I think it's foolish to do anything else. I would have thought. Yeah. Okay. Can we get a proposal for five minutes just to close session? That'd be okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. This um, can I remind members that, <coughs> as previously agreed, an informal meeting has been arranged with the NA Farming Group on the 2nd of April at 1pm, immediately after the committee meeting. Uh, can I suggest that, given the policy on no members of public being, uh, being, uh, being in the building, would members be content that this meeting was deferred until the situation around COVID-19 becomes clear? Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Can I advise member that the inter-parliamentary forum, which I was due to attend today, has been cancelled? Um, the members will wish to note that the session with Deere today will start in public session and then move into closed session to cover sensitive matters until I have frank and open discussion with Deere officials. Can I advise members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings? Okay. Um, do we have any apologies today? Morris Bradley. Morris, yeah, okay. Morris, okay. Uh, draft members, uh, minutes. Uh, members, please refer to the draft minutes of the meeting held on Thursday, 12th of March, at six, uh, at the page six to ten in your packs. Uh, can I seek agreement for the minutes? Agreed. Okay, I'll just autograph them here. Um, okay. Okay. Can I seek agreement to move to agenda six to uh, agenda item six to nine before we receive the briefing from the department? Okay. Move agenda item six to nine. Okay, uh, correspondence. Correspondence at page 44 of your pack. Each item of the correspondence has suggested action against it. Um, is members uh, content with the proposed actions against these correspondence? Agreed. Okay, Agreed, yeah. okay I want you to refer to, to the uh, forward work programme at pages 59 to 64. And members will be aware that Balmore's show on the 14th uh, of May has now been cancelled. Can I also suggest that until the situation becomes clear, we do not organise stakeholder events or large gatherings such as the Rural Community Stakeholder Event scheduled for the 28th of May? Right. Right. Um, any other business you want to raise? No. Um, so the date and time of the next meeting is Thursday, 26th of March at 10 a.m. room 30. Okay. Um, okay, I want to advise members that. Um, the, we're going to get an oral briefing from the Department on COVID-19. I want to advise members that the briefing will commence in open session before moving to a closed session, um, okay, uh, at a point where the Department indicates that this may be necessary. Are members content with this approach? Great. Thank you. Right. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Norman, uh, the Deputy Secretary, Food and Farming Group, and Robert is in the, the Gallery Grade 3 Veterinary Service Animal Health Group. Brian Doherty, Grade 3 Central Services. 
is there. And of course, Jesse, Grade 5, uh, Environment, Marine and Fisheries Group. And I'd like to invite you to brief the committee and then uh, the members will ask some questions. Okay? Can I, uh, <laughs> so, Mr Chairperson, um, we appear before you today in unprecedented and indeed uncertain times. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic will change the lives of citizens in Northern Ireland in a way not experienced before. But as a department, we are very clear that we have a key role to play in ensuring that we work collaboratively with other civil service colleagues, industry and stakeholders to maintain the flow of food and food-related products. The department has invoked its major emergency response plans with the objective of ensuring the health and well-being of our staff, continuing to deliver key essential services such as meat inspection, water inspection and prioritising as necessary, keeping products flowing and the agri-food sector operational to the greatest extent possible and acting in line with the Department of Health and scientific guidance. Key to working together is communication both internally and externally and we have already established regular engagements with the agri-food sector, processors and retail representatives to ensure that together we can address the current and emerging impacts on these sectors. You will be aware yesterday that the Head of the Civil Service issued guidance to all staff on the key actions required to ensure we act responsibly in social distancing, which is key to slowing the spread of COVID-19. Steps are now underway to support staff to work from home and to take appropriate steps within the workplace to ensure social distancing. Minister Putz has committed that we will move heaven and earth to assist the agri-food industry in keeping the supply lines operational. We also recognise the need to prioritise with a focus and spotlight on doing everything that we as a department can do to allow produce to move off farm and through the supply chain. As a department, we are not cocooned from the impacts of COVID-19 and anticipate that not all of our people will be available to meet the challenges. We anticipate that upwards of 25% of staff could be away from work at the peak of the outbreak, either as a direct or indirect result of COVID-19. And we've already taken steps to identify key priorities and business functions that will be essential to meeting our responsibilities, including supplies and production essential to food and feed, supply of essential drinking water and waste supplies, economic impacts, support to rural communities, animal health and welfare, protection of the environment, support to the agri-food industry and our people. And we will be able to elaborate further on these. In conclusion, we all recognise that these are difficult and challenging times, but the agri-food family has demonstrated on many occasions before its resilience and innovation in the face of adversity. The Minister has already committed to working collaboratively with industry and stakeholders to address these unprecedented challenges, and as a department, we will ensure that we are not found wanting. Um, as you've already pointed out, Mr Chairperson, um, Norman is here for Food and Farming Group, Robert is the Chief Veterinary Officer, and Tracy Axley is the Acting Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Um, we're all happy to take questions, and you'll appreciate there might be a bit of to and fro in and seats just to make sure that we can pick up on the mics. Do you want to add to that, Norman? Yeah, uh, Mr Chairman, maybe if I could just uh, add a few words then on the Coronavirus Emergency Bill. Uh, which is uh, coming forward. Uh, I believe the uh, Minister of Health will be uh, tabling a, a legislative consent motion uh, later today. Uh, but there are aspects of that <coughs> that relate to uh, food supply in, uh, food supply information. So powers have been included within the uh, the bill, uh, which require the food industry to provide information uh, in relation to food supply chains during the. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic and provide for the enforcement of those powers where there is non-compliance with a requirement for information. So the bill has been laid at uh, Westminster uh, today um, and aspects of that, uh, including the food supply clauses, are uh, devolved matters and therefore require a legislative consent uh, motion uh, at the Assembly. Um, and as I said, that, that will be commencing, uh, I believe, later on today. Um, so in terms of the food supply uh, clauses, it's important to note that there's already a uh, voluntary agreement in place uh, at a UK level between the, uh, the government and the main uh, UK food retailers, and that aims to ensure that up-to-date information is uh, readily available to plan for to respond to any disruption to food supply uh, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and this information is, is uh, as you will uh, appreciate, very important to ensure that we're able to assess the situation in, in relation to any disruption uh, to the food supply or any risk of disruption, 
uh, and to inform ongoing planning uh, that uh, has to take place. And while it is anticipated this information will continue to be provided uh, on a uh, voluntary basis by the food industry to government, the, these new powers are sought as part of the contingency planning, uh, event the planning for all eventualities. So the powers would require the food industry to provide uh, such information uh, if necessary uh, in certain uh, specified circumstances. These circumstances are effectively that the powers will only be used in the event that uh, uh, there is a disruption to the food supply chain or a risk of disruption, and the information is, that has already been requested uh, on a voluntary basis is not being provided. So that's the only uh, conditions on which um, the powers would be used. The powers would be subject uh, to activation by a commencement order, uh, should it become necessary to use them. Um, and the bill is focused uh, on the functioning of the supply chains, which effectively span the UK. Uh, so it's only be used to require provision of information from businesses of a uh, size uh, that are substantial enough to affect uh, food supply at a national or substantially national level. Uh, or strategically important uh, companies uh, such as nat national uh, retailers. And therefore, this is not a, p a power that is going to be used to require individuals, uh, sole traders, farmers, etc., uh, to provide any information. So it's really about that, the, the big strategic picture uh, where information would be required and is, is not forthcoming on a voluntary basis. But the expectation is that it would be uh, forthcoming on a, a voluntary basis. So that's a very quick over, overview of what those clauses uh, will mean, uh, and um, uh, I, th I think you will be uh, receiving information on that uh, very shortly. Uh, and I say it will start its uh, LCM process uh, uh, this afternoon. Department of Health in the lead. Um, um, thank you very much, Norman and Brian, for that. Um, can I ask a question? Um, we had the LNC up here last week and the topic of the coronavirus was touched on. And the point was made that, that you know, the fact we've got farms and factories, it presents uh, additional challenges in terms of biosecurity and, and trying to prevent uh, the spread of the disease. Is there any specific additional help that the department <coughs> would be providing to farms, um, farmers in, in those situations, you know, given that, that it's, more ex it's ex exceptionally challenging? Well, I, th I think, uh, I mean, we all have to follow the, the advice and the scientific advice uh, coming from a uh, public health agency, uh, and um, we all uh, should follow uh, that advice. Uh, and it's not down to the department, uh, it's not our role or responsibility, nor should we uh, become involved in advising on human health. Uh, obviously, now when it cu cuts across into animal health and welfare, then that's where uh, Robert will be uh, obviously then providing uh, information. Um, FSA also are in this space uh, in terms of advising uh, food businesses, and I believe they are uh, compiling a, a, a Q&A, which will be available on their on their website uh, to provide that additional uh, support and information uh, to food business operators. Um, sorry, and, and just the other, I suppose the other thing that which I have been lobbying a lot about, um, a lot of our um, farmers are in the process of filling in their single application forms right now, mm -hmm. and whilst I appreciate that virtually all of them are, are conducted online, you know, they may be online, but farmers aren't filling them in in isolation in their homes. They're going to agents, they're going to their neighbours, and from all my district where there's 37% of premises haven't got surplus broadband, it's not possible. So that presents a huge, a lot of the farmers, the average age of farmers is 58. And, that, and a lot of them are in the vulnerable category. Mm -hmm. So that level of social interaction with agents and others presents great challenges in terms of the social isolation and social distancing. Is there any um, is there a suggestion that within the department, could that 15th of May deadline be extended given the fact that we're in the middle of a very severe uh, crisis in terms of uh, trying to prevent the spread of the coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, we're obviously very, very acutely aware that we're now in the uh, the application uh, period for uh, sim single application, um, and we certainly uh, are looking at uh, all that we can do to provide uh, the online, uh, the tele uh, telephony help uh, and assistance uh, for farmers uh, to complete. 
I have to say at this minute, uh, they, we're actually well ahead of profile uh, in terms of the number of applications coming in, and that's very encouraging. Uh, and certainly encourage farmers uh, to, to progress as quickly as possible. Uh, obviously, if they are uh, engaging with uh, agents or, or uh, neighbours to complete, uh, then again, I think they need to follow uh, the advice uh, that's coming from PHA around social interaction, taking sensible precautions uh, around all of that. Um, at this stage, uh, we're not planning uh, any extension beyond the 15th of May. Um, but obviously, that's something we have to keep under review. But we have to realise that if the peak of this uh, pandemic is, is maybe hitting us in, in June time, uh, then really delaying it, you're actually delaying it into a, an even worse uh, scenario. So therefore, my, my strong encouragement would be for people to complete early um, and to uh, make use of this time uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, I really would encourage that. So I'm presuming um, I'm saying to Norman that the fact that the fact that um, regrettably we're out of the EU, we're not as uh, tied to that milestone mm. of the 15th of May, and and I welcomed what you said, Brian, a while ago. The, the minister said he'd move heaven and earth to support the farmers at this time. So uh, that could be moved then, you know, if if it was deemed necessary to protect the many. And I speak into a, th a farming. Um, an agent, yes, who's supporting farmers, and the, she has had dozens into her office, and these are vulnerable people. Yeah. Um, you know, that's something that I think needs to be kept under review because it is a really, really serious issue, especially now we've been told to minimise social contact. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important that, again, sensible precautions uh, are taken in terms of those interactions. I mean, obviously, don't have uh, more people in your office than you need to have, uh, you know, but uh, washing hands and you know, any surfaces that are being touched. Um, you know, hands in between uh, consultations. Um, but I say it, it's it's really a case of do it early, uh, mm. because um, you know if we delay this into June, uh, early July, um, you know you're into the actual you know into the peak uh, of uh, projected peak uh, of the uh, the outbreak. Uh, so you're actually getting into a worse situation, but also thinking out the other side. Uh, it's actually then uh, at risk of significantly delaying payment, uh, and that could be a time when the industry really does need uh, payment to be going out uh, through the door. Now, obviously, we also have provisions of force majeure, force majeure I going to ask uh, so that. That, that exists as well. Mm. Uh, so all of these things uh, will, would, would be looked at, but I think the key message mm. is really do it early um, and, uh, and, you know, and take sensible precautions. Certainly, all of the, the online and the telephony support from the department is there, uh, and again, make, make use of that um, and, and, and complete your application as soon as possible. And say they're well ahead of profile at this point in time. Thank you for that, Norman. William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I suppose many of us should be appreciative that there's many in the agriculture sector. I mean, tens of or thousands of people are going to have to work as normal to try and. Uh, ensure that the, our food shelves and the supermarkets and all are, are stocked with food. I think, uh, you know, irrespective of all this, you know, that's a sector that has a very important role to play. Can you envisage any issues in regard to, you know, if issues arisen? Like, I mean, we could mention names of firms and big numbers of staff. If there was a situation or is where many staff did take ill, could create an issue in, on, in that sector in, in ensuring that the food is on the shelf, couldn't it? I suppose the food sector is, is, is different from many other sectors in our economy uh, in that it's, it's going full tilt uh, yeah. at the minute. Yeah. Uh, and its concern is uh, not lack of demand. Uh, it's actually ensuring that it has uh, the people uh, in place to service that demand. Uh, so it's a completely different scenario from for example, leisure, uh, tourism, uh, where they effect effectively demand is gone. Yeah. Um, so in a very different uh, scenario, so the industry is very much working towards keeping, and, and we will do what we can to help them, keeping supply lines moving, uh, keeping uh, food flowing. Importantly, keeping product moving off farm, uh, which has to be part of all of this, uh, and, and certainly we will be doing all we can to play our part uh, in ensuring that that, that happens. Uh, it's, it's so important that we keep those uh, supply lines moving. I think, Mr. Chairman, that's vital. But for I mean, 
I think if our population went into the, into the food chain, into the store, and there's no food, I mean, it would be then you would have a real issue. Uh, so it, it is vital that those people can uh, keep going. Uh, Robert, uh, just going to be a question for Robert. Um, in, do you anticipate that TB tests will continue as usual, Robert? We have been working to prioritise uh, right across the department our key services, and within my group, uh, keeping food moving, as Norman has said, is our, our key service. So the the issues that I am prioritising is, of course, our public health service within the abattoirs, the meat inspectors, um, a particularly vulnerable group, uh, and uh, one that uh, one that concerns me. Uh, I think the highest of, of my areas of delivering service. I'll get to your question. Don't worry, William. Okay. Um, so we're, 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 what we're doing is that every veterinary officer I have is actually qualified to inspect on uh, online, and they have been in this last day, couple of days familiarising themselves, so that when spaces appear in the line, we have we have we have staff that can that are qualified and fit to take those places. So. Obviously, then we're trying to keep certification going, and if you keep certification going, it's important to um, to have the the requirements of the certificate fulfilled, and that often requires animal health programmes, salmonella testing, and, and other issues, in order that the certificates can be signed and the and the product can be kept moving uh, to to markets, and that's important for the the, the continuing prosperity of the industry, uh, and then. I obviously have to look after episodic disease. We'll talk about that later. The exotic diseases that we're trying to keep out and ensure we keep them out through the portal controls. Uh, I have to ensure welfare on farm and investigate any welfare findings we have. We can't let that drop. And it is my intention to try and keep TB testing going, um, to keep the TB testing program going. Perhaps not everything we do at the, t at the moment, but we know from 2001 and the foot and mouth crisis that if you stop f uh, TB testing. Um, the, the, re the results can be devastating. Um, uh, there was a doubling, a tripling of the level of TB on farms at that stage. So the intention at the moment, and everything changes, is to try and keep the TB testing programme going. But that, of course, will rely on farmers being prepared to let their private vet onto the farm for that purpose. Uh, and we, we have to keep looking at that risk. At the moment, I think it's acceptable. Um, the vets will be on farms for other things, obviously. Uh, and we have to try and uh, keep that going. And it's also important for the exports that we are able to maintain our health status through our TB programme. So that's eventually got the answer to your question, <laughs> William. Um, oh, very important. We, we have, um, just to add to what Brian said earlier on, uh, across the department, we have triggered our emergency processes um, because we know that um, you know, 20% of our staff are likely to be absent from work at least, and I would have thought perhaps more with caring and responsibilities. Uh, so we have to do this prioritisation to ensure that we, that we can maintain the essential services, and we also have to organise ourselves in a different way. And I, I'll thank my staff, even though it isn't ramped up yet, for flexibility, because they always do. They show the flexibility of going to where they're most needed. Okay. Just one thing. Just could you see issue in ports? Like, I mean, there's a lot of fresh fruit and all comes from other countries. Can you see issues with that? With that? Um, I think, William, there's no aspect of our normal life that is going to remain as it is, um, except my garden might be in better state by the end of this than it would normally be. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, John? John, I'm sure if John would just... If John would let me just comment on that point that was made, it's only a small point, and then I don't need to come back in again. It's just with our freight services uh, um, and our ferry operators, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, just in my small office, I've written off to the economy minister, and it's to do with um, most of the sailors which ply the Irish Sea are from Poland. And you should aware of the problem that's there, and everything was done possibly to rectify that. Yeah, that's that's actually been raised with us by Good. the Department for Infrastructure, um, and we are aware of what Stendhal line, line in particular yes, and the actions correct. that they're taking, because we are aware of the, as, as you've pointed out, the, the number of uh, individuals from Poland. They are not now maybe able to return home yes. as they would have because they've closed the borders, and I understand that Stendhal line are providing appropriate accommodation on for ship. them on ship. Okay. Yeah. So okay. just, as long as, just wanted to make sure that they were aware of it no more than that. Thanks, Chair. Just, just, just to add, um, 
the, some of the actions we've taken is the Secretary established uh, Agri-Food Liaison Group with the Secretary and, and Brian chairs um, three times a week. Obviously, it's now mainly by, um, by virtual, uh, but that's important so that we can hear uh, the concerns of the industry directly from their leaders, and, uh, and that, that's a very useful forum. I've also established a group called the Food and Feed Incident Management Group that was established as part of the report after dioxins, uh, which is a cross-government uh, piece where Department of Health, Department of Economy, uh, um, Invest NI and others are present in the room so that we can, uh, we can liaise about problems uh, and make sure that we're all dealing with the same problem in some sort of a joined-up way. Uh, so that, that's working very well. And actually, I'm very encouraged by the fact that other departments at moments like this are sending uh, senior representatives to that meeting uh, to ensure that we're, we're joined up on what we're doing. So that's where issues like that go, uh, and we, we try and uh, maintain a somewhat of a, a, a joint attempt. John? Chair, thank you. Possibly back to, to Norman as well with this one. Um, the uh, question, you'll be aware of some issues I raised around trying to get clarification from the Minister. Um, in the context of some of us undertaking to try not to consult ministers uh, across this place and officials with uh, non urgent assembly questions at this time, the rate of resources that that causes, that we might get regular statements and updates, and that, that's ongoing work currently. Um, but in, in that regard, can I ask that um, if the department are looking at any impacts that have already been internationally? food supplies and deal other supplies as a result of COVID-19 and learning lessons from that and can we up, be updated on that as we go forward if those um, examples are being, being looked at and also as consideration being given to the general impact on the agricultural, we could ask this for a here, but on, on the agricultural sector are we looking at an impact on farmers who might have to in certain circumstances employ ad hoc or casual help Themselves. Okay. In terms of uh, inter uh, disruptions to international supplies, uh, I mean that's not something that uh, we're, we're yet picking up. Uh, but obviously, you know, we, we keep very close eye uh, on all of these things, and we're we're plugged into uh, the, the DEFRA-led uh, food chain emergency liaison group. Uh, where well, those types of things uh, then uh, would, uh, would 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 come out. Uh, so we're, we're very much plugged into national um, uh, intelligence chain, chains and networks uh, and all of that, uh, as well as obviously uh, with our own uh, local uh, retailers. Uh, they're part of our three weekly uh, phone in as well. Uh, so we would soon uh, pick up uh, on, on any supply issues uh, coming down the road. Um, yeah, in, in terms of general impact on uh, agriculture, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's, there's no part uh, of society is going to be uh, immune uh, or, uh, from uh, the, the impact here. Um, and I suppose it's down to businesses of all sizes, all scales, including sole traders and farmers, to look at contingency, to ask the question, what if? Um, and I think that's something that uh, we would really encourage farmers to do, to think about, OK, what if I wasn't able for a few days or longer uh, to actually do what I'm doing today? Uh, so what are my arrangements um, and what arrangements are, am I putting in place um, to actually ensure that livestock are looked after, uh, etc.? Uh, so I think that's something that uh, everybody should be looking at. Um, uh, Philip? Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah. Agri-foods, obviously, an all island sector with lots of uh, to and fro. I mean, uh, uh, is the department uh, in contact with uh, the department in the south? Is there ongoing work across the island in relation to the problem? Uh, and then, just, and, and, I mean, most people have covered it in, in their questions just about the impact of resources both internally within the department uh, and also, I mean, the, the potential impacts within the sector. You know, as it's likely to happen when large numbers of workers become ill. Okay, uh, Robert, do you want to pick up on the uh, contacts with the South? Uh, yeah, okay. So, as you're aware, Philip, I, 
as Chief Veterinary Officer, have very close contacts and almost daily uh, phone calls with my colleague Martin Blake in Dublin. Um, in fact, it's only a fortnight since I took my entire senior team down and we had a joint meeting, and where, of course, this was one of the subjects for debate. Um, we're all working um, to the same risk assessment. We're all working to the same data. So there is, of course, an awful lot that we have in common when we're trying to deal with these issues. Um, but I think both of us are concentrating on our own jurisdictions at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to be done. Uh, well, do you okay with that, Phil? I, well, I, I was going to... I mean, I, mean I, I just thought that there would have been sort of greater uh, contact in this time of crisis, given the, the, you know, the invisible border with regard to our agri-food sector. Yeah. And you know those those contacts are continuing as business as usual, um, but we're all. I won't be travelling down again. Let's put it that way. Um, Obviously, um, it's one of the things we've done. We've stopped all travel, but no. I think you can be reassured that there are there, there's constant ongoing, uh, ongoing, ongoing contact. Um, do you see then? Um, just before I come in again, um, what I should have, what I meant to ask as well is. The Caffrey Colleges, what, what measures have been put in place for the, the Caffrey Colleges in terms of um, social contact advice, distance learning? What, 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 yeah. How is the department prepared for that? Okay, so it's quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit is happening uh, around uh, Caffrey. So um, earlier on this week, a uh, decision was taken that all uh, farmer training events, uh, food training events, uh, would be stopped. Uh, again, we don't want to bring farmers uh, into any in increased risk, uh, particularly again given the age profile and their sole traders, and it's, it, it's often it's just them, uh, so we don't want to place them uh, at, at any uh, enhanced risk. So all of those farmer training events uh, have now stopped. Um, and in line with uh, UU and QUB, all the HE provision uh, at uh, CAFRI, uh, so we have students that are being. Um, for example, Ag Tech is through Queen's and, and, and the other degrees through UU. Um, so effectively, they're now off campus uh, and have been since uh, Wednesday, I think it was, um, and delivering uh, remotely. Uh, and uh, then finally, the FE students, so decision uh, that in line with the decision around the schools, uh, the FE students uh, also will vacate the campus. Uh, so basically, uh, all students will be off uh, campus uh, from Caffrey, uh, and all industry training events uh, have already stopped. And what will the implications be for the learning programmes? Like, there are students obviously who are enrolled to do um, degrees and various courses. What will impact that will that have for them in terms of them obtaining their degrees and finishing off their studies? Or will, uh, how, how will the department handle that? Yeah, I mean, these are all things now that are very much uh, actively being looked at. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the students have put in the hard work uh, up mm -hmm. to this point, yeah. uh, and particularly those in their, uh, coming up to the end of their uh, degree. Uh, clearly, yeah. you know, uh, they want to ensure now that they have the opportunity to actually uh, you know, demonstrate what off. they've learned. Uh, so those are things that are being very actively looked at at the moment, how so to actually the, facilitate all so of this. the department will be putting in place measures to enable them to yes. finish off their degrees by distance learning or, and whatever? That's right. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Can I just maybe pick up yes. on, on Philip's Sorry other bit of his question that. around resources? Um, if that's okay, uh, I mean, you'll be aware we have around about 3,000 staff in the department, and of those three, uh, and we're based over 70 plus locations. Um, of those 3,000, 1,400 have laptops. Um, and during today and tomorrow, we will go through a process with staff, managers, to ensure that we can affect home working uh, and the necessary support mechanisms that we need to put in place. I suppose the overriding uh, issue for us all is social distancing, so this is one of the tools available to us. Uh, there will be elements of our work that uh, cannot be done from home working, um, so staff will either continue to be in the location they're in, and we may well consolidate to a point uh, just to ensure that there's the, the duty of care that we have for our staff. Uh, we're also trying to secure more laptops uh, as across the whole Northern Ireland Civil Service um, to make sure that you know people can continue to provide, as I said, maybe at the outset. We must make sure that we don't lose focus. We are here to provide a service to our customers, um, and we want to try and maintain that as far as is practicably possible. Uh, we have guidance out uh, centrally from the Northern Ireland Civil Service HR 
uh, around uh, showing some discretion and empathy with staff in these very difficult circumstances, particularly as we now know schools will close with effect from tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and we have a lot of staff as well who have child uh, caring responsibilities along with caring responsibilities for vulnerable adults. Uh, I think it will be a little bit messy at the beginning, if I'm perfectly honest, as we sort of uh, work our way into what homeworking really means. Um, but I would be confident that we will still be able to provide a service to customers. Okay, Philip, up enough. I just mean uh, that was one part of my question, just in terms of like the potential for you know the workforce within the industry in big numbers. You know, is there I suppose forward planning in relation to what happens there? I think the the Department for Communities. I understand is sort of taking the lead around employment and all related employment issues. But from our own department's point of view, we've put in place mechanisms, and Norman's already alluded to the engagement that we're having with industry and sector organisations three times a week, uh, and that'll give us a sense of what is actually happening in the industry. And we've also put in place a mechanism of one-to-one -one contact with the sectors, just to get a sense of what the labour market intelligence is starting to tell us. Um, and then working jointly with the Department for Communities and others to help ensure that where there are gaps developing, that the Department for Communities can respond in whatever way they can. It, 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 so it was mentioned to me yesterday that probably industry is ahead of us. I mean, they're, they're pretty good at this stuff themselves, given that the market conditions, the way they can fluctuate. Um, so I think they've been looking at their own contingency plans in terms of you know, where they may well lose staff because they, they have the virus particularly around you know, HGV drivers, et cetera, what the impact would be if they, if they couldn't get product either off farm or, or further on into the food chain. I have to say that uh, they have been very proactive in terms of uh, introducing protocols uh, to try and minimise the risk uh, to spread uh, uh, or, or contact, uh, for example, between themselves and, and, uh, and, and other parts of society. Uh, so they have been very proactive in actually drawing these up, um, and, uh, and, and that is very encouraging uh, in terms of what they have been doing uh, around all of that to try and minimise those risks. Okay, um, Harry. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is more to do with like livestock and meats, but it's just something that I could ask. Like at a local level, sale yards in March closed or closing. In the future, how do we get around this, and what plan on the set in place for abattoirs also? Robert? I was very pleased to hear Margaret Hillmarket yesterday uh, on the, in the morning news uh, asking people to attend the market, only those who are hauling, buying or selling, uh, no visitors please. And I think that's, uh, that was very sensible, uh, proactive advice from the industry. It's important we try and keep the whole food chain <coughs> working, and it's only as strong as its weakest link. And that's, I think, where the analysis is that we're going through. And I feel that it's important to try and keep the markets open as long as possible as a, a way of, of maintaining incomes on farm as, as much as anything else. But each step is important. Um, try and keep the slaughter plants open, hence my concentration on the meat inspection, um, their own workers. Uh, what will tend to happen there if slaughter floor uh, workers are off is that they slow the line and space the, space the workers as much as they can. Uh, people try and do two rolls on a line rather than the, the one, but there comes a stage where you just can't keep it going, and it's very skilled work. Uh, so th that, will be that will be a moving feast. The one that worries me most of all, as far as animal welfare is concerned, is of course the intensive livestock uh, place uh, sector, both the poultry and the pigs. Um, now, in the poultry, the slaughter line tends to be highly automated. There are very few people on it. Uh, but you have to keep moving chickens off, 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 off farm, or you get a real welfare problem. If there are even a few days, then they get overweight and give you old difficulties with both marketing and processing. And the same with the pig industry. It's a conveyor belt, and it has to be kept moving. Uh, and then, uh, as we've talked about haul airs as a, as, a, as a weak place, HGV drivers. Um, but there must be some way in which HGV drivers being laid off by one business can be employed within another. Uh, and that's something that I think that the industry would do much better than government trying to, trying to sort out that particular problem. Yeah. Cleaners from one area that are laid off can clean a meat plant or can clean another premises. And it's how industry can be facilitated, perhaps by the Department of Economy or wherever, to, 
to set up the systems that allow that brokerage of staff. Very good answer, sir. Appreciate that, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, Rosemary. Thank you. Um, just, I want to go back on the impact on the campuses. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, with Anna Skillen being in my constituency. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to yeah, you've got the students off set off off the campus now. Of course, a lot of the a lot of the work based in the campuses. You know, you still have your animals mm -hmm. that need work, uh, cows and milk. Horses, etc. Obviously, with yeah. within Anniskillen, do you have the staff then within the campuses to do this extra work that the students aren't there? Yeah, and again, to, that's to work with. Yeah, and uh, again, they're quite dependent on students over the year. Uh, no, dependent on them. Yeah, as part as part of their training. Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. So again, uh, measures being taken uh, to to mitigate risks. So again, splitting teams. Uh, and also people who may have been um, industrial staff who might have been uh, demonstrators uh, are now actually you know part of you know the teams that will look after the animals uh, but again dividing them up uh, so that you don't have you know the, the risk of an entire uh, team uh, going out uh, mm -hmm. or being being isolated so again it's taking those sensible precautions uh, to minimize the risk yeah okay and um, second question Has any thought being we've been given to financial support, perhaps, if the far if farmers or some of the farm community, or even some of the marts, uh, get into slight yeah. difficulties. I'm not suggesting they will, but always a, always a possibility. Has there been any cross department thought on that? Could we maybe take that in closed session? Yeah. Or, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to move to closed session now, Norman, or right. or do you want to? Yeah. Oh, Patty. No, I. Oh, you asked the question. Ask you kindly let me in, Chair. No problem. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Claire. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and thanks very much for being here. And I'm sure that you are under a huge amount of pressure and stress at the minute. Um, but maybe want to come back to looking at that um, the increased demand on the, the food sector. Um, obviously, that we don't have an increased number of people, and it's not that all the people are getting hungrier and hungrier, but um, it's stockpiling, it's the panic buying, it's the the wider context. Um, I just maybe want to come in and see what we're doing to calm that situation, and if we are getting the COVID-19 um, bill coming from Westminster, are we looking ahead in terms of potential rationing for people? Um, and if we're going to keep this increased demand or allow that to continue, I know that you know, supermarket shelves are empty and some markets, particularly in Belfast, have been closed. Um, so people are, are feeling that pressure. Just what's going on in terms of those types of conversations? Yeah, uh, again, uh, it's about keeping the supply lines uh, open um, and um, all the information we're getting back from uh, from the retailers, and, and you would have heard this yourself, you know, that they're operating, they're functional, uh, they're fully functional. Um, now there's, there has been a, a marked change in the market uh, because effectively food service sector effectively is gone. Um, so it's, it's, it's a switch to effectively food retail because people are now eating in home rather than eating outside. So you've had that switch around in terms of just the nature of the market has changed. Um, and it, it's all about you know responding to that um, and the industry is, is responding. Now, this sort of, sort of sort of panic buying, uh, for, for want of a, a better word, uh, I mean, that w can only go on for so long. Uh, there has to be a, uh, a real line, but there's only so much material you can store at home. Start building uh, shipments. And uh, yes, uh, uh, so uh, that that should correct itself. Um, but I think it's just the supply lines are continually making the points. You know, the supply is there, um, and and the the only difficulty is people are just over purchasing. Um, and. But there will come a point in time when, when that will, will correct itself, because um, you know uh, you just will not keep on buying. Uh, it costs money, uh, and you simply don't have the capacity to store uh, infinite amounts of food uh, in the home. Um, so it, it, it will, uh, at a point in time, correct itself. But the, but there is a, a fundamental shift in the market away from eating out to eating eating home. So that that 
uh, is, is, is effectively a change in the market as well. We're just waiting for people to stop stockpiling themselves. We're not going to step in and calm the situation at all. Well, I think uh, government has been doing that uh, and has been saying, look, you know, the supply lines are uh, robust. They're there. Uh, there's, there's, there's no threats uh, to, uh, to shortages. Uh, the industry has been saying that as well, um, and it's really... My well, point being that it's not working. I mean, I know that we don't deal with medicines, but, you know, medicines is another one where people just can't get... The people who need them can't mm. get them, um, and it's the same with a lot of the food supplies and the supermarket chains as well. So we know that we're putting the message out there to try and reassure people, but my point is that it's not working, so are we just going to continue doing that for the foreseeable until... People have nowhere left to store things. Yeah, um, and I suppose the, the retailers are trying uh, things like, uh, you know, for example, uh, restricting uh, the amount that people can buy in any one trip. Now, there's, there's limitations to that. Uh, people can come back into the store again. Um, also, it's just, a, I suppose, the, um, the duty of care to their staff as well. Some people can get quite aggressive uh, on, on, on those sorts of uh, issues. Um, also, stores now looking at um, reserving certain time slots uh, for, for, for example, vulnerable pe people within society. I mean, those are all very sensible things, uh, and that's what the market is doing uh, to try and uh, control uh, the, the demand effectively, the excess demand that's coming forward. Um, and that's entirely right uh, that they, they continue to do that. Okay, maybe just ask one more then. Yeah, go um, ahead. Just want to think about it. Um, I'm just noting also that Northern Ireland has just reported its first death this morning from COVID-19 as well. So just a bit shocked with that, and it's obviously desperately sad news. Um, but we are just facing, you know, the calm before the storm, as it has been called. Are we taking any measures, or is there anything being done in terms of collecting? as much data as possible and um, because obviously every aspect of people's daily living is going to change drastically over the next short period of time um, and I'm thinking in terms of the departmental remit in terms of the environmental um, consequences um, as well as the food supplies and the agri sector are we are we on the ball with that one uh, and be able to respond to it just to see if there's any more changes see if there's any learning to be had yeah and that's where we have uh, those very close contacts with industry we have that three times a week uh, currently. Uh, obviously, that could step up uh, if need be, but basically we have within that uh, three weekly or three times a week uh, dial-in, you will have all sectors ringing in, the pigs, poultry, dairy, uh, retail, um, the red meat. They're all there. They're all on the phone, and they're feeding back information. Uh, that they're, they're picking up the market intelligence. Um, and the issues that uh, that they see, the concerns that they have, and obviously then we can then feed that into uh, the broader government uh, structures as, as necessary. Um, and, uh, yeah, so Claire, I'm also involved in those meetings, so we're there from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, so we're picking up that intelligence as well. But maybe to give you a flavour for the, the Environment Agency, some of our, I'm at the risk of saying this again, we are really trying to focus down on what are the essential areas of work that we have to focus on. Um, one of them actually is the drinking water. So we are the inspectorate of uh, Northern Ireland Water. So we are making sure that we have all our staff in that can make sure that we continue to monitor the drinking water. Um, and that's extremely important. So we know Northern Ireland Water have instigated their incident management plan. Um, and we're monitoring that and keeping that um, very much a top priority in the agency. That then links into water pollution um, and water quality. So again, one of the key areas for the Northern Ireland Environment Agency is to make sure that we have a staff still being vigilant in terms of pollution incidents um, and we're, we're watching that very closely back to your question um, nothing we're still continuing to do our inspections um, obviously we're taking account of all the risks the people that we do inspect should it be industry should it be farmers um, so that's the, the moving face that we're working in but we've definitely prioritized drinking water water quality uh, and after that then we also have waste issues so we know we have to keep Really keep in our mind that actually in a stockpiling of waste, um, you know, people can't store it. What are they doing with it? We don't want any uh, illegal waste dumpings. Um, so again, that we we watching if there's a spike in that, we'll know be shoppish. Um, but again, working on the basis that we could have 20, 25 percent less staff. Okay. Okay. Members are content now. We can move to close items. 
the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. You got those anyway, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, as I said uh, in the introduction, uh, the, the we have voluntary mechanisms at the minute for sharing information, so it's only where those break down and those fail that uh, we then would, would need to revert uh, to requiring the information. Um, and if we're going to require the information, then you have to have a, a means of enforcing that if necessary. Now, our expectation is we, we won't ever need this, but uh, we have to make provision uh, in case it, it might be. So there are uh, provision for penalties, um, and it's a financial penalty up to a maximum of 1% of qualifying turnover. Uh, that is the same structure that exists within the uh, groceries code uh, uh, adjudicator. Uh, those same powers exist in terms of the ability to, uh, for, to impose a maximum financial penalty. Of course, there is the flexibility to impose uh, a, a lower level of penalty, if appropriate. Uh, the powers um, in the bill um, will only will be subject to a commencement order, uh, so it won't be a point of royal assent that the, the powers actually will be enacted. It will have to be a commencement order uh, to actually uh, make these uh, operable. Um, the expectation, because this is really around national uh, food supply is that um, expectation is that if this happens, uh, then it would be uh, all of the administrations uh, would agree to the Secretary of State uh, making um, uh, a requirement for businesses to, to provide the information. Uh, there is a possibility that we could enact it at a regional level if necessary. Um, we will be um, constructing a, a memorandum of uh, understanding uh, between all four administrations to govern how these powers uh, will be used uh, and, and how they would be uh, enacted if necessary. Uh, and we're also working with um, other government departments here in Northern Ireland because it may just not be DERA that has a requirement for information. It could be other parts uh, of government as well, and they may come to, to there and say, look, we really need this information. We can't get it. Uh, can, can we use the powers, or can you use the powers to ensure that the information is provided? Um, so it has that flexibility uh, built into it. Okay. Is there any more uh, questions relating to this? Written to this uh, the coronavirus bill, as relates to here. Okay, I don't want to just take a few minutes. Just to, uh, I'm conscious we just we just have to get our hands on this here. I'll just take a couple of minutes to take a quick take a look through it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I just take a couple of minutes.
Okay, um, members, maybe Norman, if I could ask you, obviously we have just got this uh, coronavirus bill and, and the absence of an explanatory memorandum. Would you be able to just give us a, an overview from the department's perspective as to what this actually means for the department and for here? Yeah, uh, well, uh, as I said, it's, it's really uh, to cover the, the, the possibility of um, us not having the information that currently is coming forward on a voluntary basis uh, from the, uh, the food supply chain. Um, those mechanisms are already uh, in place uh, and they're operating well. Uh, but in the, in the event that either the information is not coming forward on a voluntary basis or is knowingly uh, false information is coming forward, then effectively this provides a fallback position. Uh, whereby the Secretary of State, uh, a Minister of the Crown, uh, can actually uh, commence uh, this piece of legislation to require the information to be provided. Uh, and it's really required when there is a, a, a real risk, a uh, perceived risk or an actual disruption to the food supply chain, uh, and information is needed uh, to, to do that. And it only is used where the information is not provided voluntarily. So you always start with the voluntary approach, uh, and it's only where, where the voluntary approach is not working that you would then revert uh, to using the powers within this particular uh, element of the bill. The, the bill is obviously much wider uh, than this. This is just the food supply element uh, that, that uh, uh, we're, we're looking at. Uh, so effectively, that, that's what it's for in, in a nutshell, uh, to ensure that that strategic level information is provided to government. Um, in, in respect of potential disruption to food supply. Um, just before we move around the members then, Norman, I just note that on section 23 and 24 made reference to appropriate authority, and they, then again on section 24, um, again the appropriate authority has been, authorised authority has been listed as DERA. Yeah. Could you tell me what's the role of the Assembly? Would, would this, I think this come before the Assembly in all of this? Uh, well, effectively, the, the role of the Assembly is to give the, the, the legislative consent uh, for uh, the, 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 the bill, um, and the bill will be introduced um, for consideration uh, this afternoon. Uh, the Department of Health uh, are in lead in the overall bill because it's much wider uh, than just this, this aspect. Uh, so, effectively, <coughs> once um, once the bill uh, is, is in place, uh, the act is in place, uh, then, it, it, then I suppose it comes back then to the, um, effectively the rule of the Assembly is over at that point. Uh, you've given consent uh, for Westminster to, to, to operate. Move members. Uh, Pat? Well, that was, <coughs> thank you, Chair. That was uh, probably on section 24, where it says the Department of Agriculture and Environment and Rural Affairs uh, are the appropriate authorities, and then we have it coming in that it's the Secretary of State. Do we have, you've said that we have a role to play in this through the Assembly, but it can be overruled. Just looking at this quickly, if the Secretary of State says that that has to come in, is that the same for all of the other jurisdictions? For Scotland, I see here it's the Scottish Minister and the Welsh Minister. I mean, has he the power to overrule them as well? Uh, well, the Secretary of State may not impose a requirement uh, under, under Which this. Which one is that, of, number four? Uh, this is under uh, five. Two, two, five. Two, five, yeah. So the Secretary of State may not impose a requirement uh, under Section uh, 1 without the consent of an authority referred to in 1B uh, to D, uh, which, uh, and, and which includes uh, DERA. So, uh, so effectively, uh, that consent is required, uh, and so there will be a sitting underneath this. Uh, there will be a, a memorandum of understanding between the four administrations in terms of how the powers uh, under this uh, element of the overall bill would be enacted uh, or, or used in practice. Uh, and, and remember, this is about really disclosure of information uh, that is of strategic or national significance. Um, so this is not about um, individual sole traders or anything like that. It's about those, that big strategic picture 
um, and, and that's what the focus of this is about. So just small, so the Scottish Minister is <coughs> area Scotland, Wales is Wales, mm -hmm. and uh, Dara's area is Northern Ireland. Yes, that's right. But there is, there is that mechanism that we, in the Assembly, there's a mechanism whereby uh, we could, uh, through this uh, power, um, require that information at a regional level uh, if there was a perceived need, uh, if there was some very specific regional uh, issue, um, then, then we would have a power so, under this. So, and then can you bypass the Assembly in any way or you need that underlying commitment from us? No, there's no, there's no further subordinate legislation uh, would come forward uh, to actually make this happen. Uh, well, there's the, the commencement order uh, to make it live, uh, but then after that, uh, there's no further role. So, see the information that you referred to then, Norman, um, how, how would this be used? And could you give me any examples of the type of information that is required? Uh, well, I, I suppose it's, it's really around uh, anything to do with the supply chain. The supply chain is actually defined as anything from primary production, uh, including fishing and agriculture, all the way through to consumer. So anything within that chain uh, or connected uh, to the operation of that chain. So it also could include people who are providing services or goods to support the chain. So, for example, uh, packaging um, or... Um, Fertilizers, feedstuffs, anything uh, that actually supports the operation of the supply, the food supply chain. Uh, and so, if there was some disruption or perceived disruption uh, to uh, either the operation of the chain itself or those support services around the chain, uh, and that information was not coming forward to government, then this could be used to compel uh, the provide provision of that information. So, if there was some perceived risk in the supply of I don't know, feedstuffs or something like this. Uh, that could have a, a really profound in, uh, impact, uh, and that information was not readily being offered, volunteered, <coughs> then uh, we could use this to actually compel that information to be provided. It would be in rare circumstances, wouldn't it? It would, be, yeah. Yeah, it would be in rare circumstances. Yeah. I mean, if, if those sorts of issues are, are starting to emerge, you would like to think uh, that people will make that known to government. Yeah. Uh, but I perhaps you know, some sort of commercial sensitivity might uh, you know, make somebody suggest, well, I'll not disclose that. Um, but it would be, you know, again, it back, comes back to that uh, strategic and uh, you know, national level uh, of, of information that you're talking about. And what sanctions would there be, Norman, if... Uh, if you know. Failure to provide the information or provide false information. Mm -hmm. Well, it's up to, but like the, the grocery adjudicator, it's up to one percent of turnover um, to be uh, imposed as a, a financial penalty for non-provision or provision of false uh, information. Okay, uh, Claire. Thank you, um, <coughs> Chair. Um, and I'm looking. So this is really we have been given today is really looking at. Um, information and supply monitoring. Do you think there's anything else in this bill that this committee should be looking at with regard to the remit that we have? And I'm thinking in particular of, because um, this is really about giving special powers uh, and setting up a lot of new structures uh, on, in line with what we're facing. But I'm thinking in terms of food, and I'm going to go back to the rationing point again. Um, if we're not looking at rationing or monitoring or trying to take control of that situation, the potential for food crimes um, could be there um, in terms of you know what level of security on farms and shops and people's homes as well if they're stockpiling. You know, is there anything in there that we need to be looking at or mindful of? In yeah. terms of those, this, this is purely on information, but yeah, just within the bill in general. Uh, not that I'm aware of. No. Okay, no, not that I'm aware of. Because they're setting up new commissions and commissioners, as far as I'm aware as well. But I yeah, haven't I mean, had a look at it yet, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm just broadly aware of all other elements within uh, okay. the bill. For example, on um, you know bringing nurses etc. back into the the workplace yeah. and that sort of. There's there's all sorts of uh, you know very re broad range of cross-cutting powers that are within this bill. It's a bit of a catch-all. Do you feel that this is the only part really that's the only the part of, of this relevant to us. Yeah, that's the only part that's relevant to us. John? 
Chair, we ask uh, that the owner stop it for reasons of exceptional circumstances that this needs to be produced. Um, the end date of this provision? Yep. Many information be given around that. I'm assuming it is envisaged that, that this will collapse at a time yes. when one of you resumes. There's a, there's a two yeah, years. How, how will that be determined? Yeah, it's a two year sunset clause. So after two years, this falls. <coughs> and, sorry, Claire, do you want back in there? Could I just ask, then, within that two years, what uh, uh, do you know if there's any processes to monitor, to check in, to relook at it again, or will it just be set for two years? Set for two years, but uh, this this is going through Westminster, and I know, for example, this morning uh, reports on uh, on the uh, national news uh, that, uh, for example, the Labour Party were calling for a six monthly uh, review of this. Um, yeah. So. But, I mean, these things will be addressed uh, as it passage through Westminster. Uh, so this is this is the the, the, the bill as introduced uh, into Westminster. There may well be further changes uh, on its passage through. See then, just for the pat on there. <coughs> see from a um, department's point of view, what um, what effort or what measures have you taken to ensure that the people who are in the food supply chain are um, as connected to it? Uh, are aware of the requirements under this? Yeah, so this was, uh, as I've been introduced at pace, mm. as yeah. uh, given the, the nature of uh, the thing. So really, it's, it's DEFRA uh, will be taking a lead uh, in the communication uh, of this. So we've had no uh, direct communication uh, on, on the introduction of this uh, particular uh, section. Um, you know, effectively, it, we, we were brought into this middle of last week. So this has been done at pace. Um, but DEFRA will be leading on the, the communication and interaction with the, uh, the, the rural food sector. Uh, and again, this is you know at, at national level um, in terms of the significance uh, of, of issues. Uh, William? Mr Chairman, if I picked this up right, this would only be used in a situation where someone failed to produce information. Yes, right? that's right. Not relevant places. Yeah. Or are you concerned that we should yeah. forward? Yeah. Um, Pat, were you looking in there? I was, I was just, again, I mean, I'm trying to just look at the inquests you know, for, uh, and the change to that. And I don't have Section 72C. I don't have that. I'm, I'm asking, I'm, I'm just looking at what, what is written down under Section 30 of a death of a prisoner. Uh, I mean, those those are issues that are not not part of the to this. They're they're in the bill, but they're not part of what we're we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, so I assume that will be dealt with in the public no, that's, right, just, that's what I was wanting. Yeah. I just didn't understand that there, Chair. So yeah, we we end after we end after twenty section twenty seven about five. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Okay. Have had their their say? So, um, so listen, I would like to thank us for coming up here today and again for a, um, I think we described them as surreal circumstances mm -hmm. earlier when we were talking this morning. I really appreciate just coming up here today and no doubt we'll be seeing you in the time ahead. Um, okay, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good luck in the weeks ahead. Yeah, you might want just to say. <coughs> okay. okay. So, um, looks we we've had that briefing from the department there on this uh, the coronavirus bill. I just want to ask members, um, do you want to have a further meeting to discuss this in more detail? Bearing in mind that it will also be coming into the chamber at some stage, anyway. Not for me. I'm happy okay. to. I have enough. Yeah. Yeah. Happy enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happy enough. Okay, we're going to move now to closed session to consider the draft report into the uh, agriculture bill. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly 